Join me for a conversation with game master and game designer Richard Davis. Welcome to DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Level up your RPG campaigns by filling yourself with stories and knowledge. Explore topics from archaeology to film history to writing to literature and much, much more. This is DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Welcome to the show. My name is Matt and I am your host. This is the podcast where we learn how to become better game masters and role players by filling ourselves with stories and knowledge. I have an outstanding interview coming right up. But first, if you need help cutting down your game master prep time and adding a little extra at the table, you're in luck. You should check out my books, The Books of Random Tables. My books of random tables help you cut down your prep time, help you add details at the table without wasting you or your players' time. You can check them out at Amazon.com, DriveThroughRPG.com, or my own website, DiceGeeks.com. Just search for the book of random tables. You will find fantasy, modern, sci-fi, cyberpunk, Wild West, and more. Also, if you enjoy this podcast... Please like, rate, review, or subscribe to it wherever you are listening. Those things help the show immensely, and I would greatly appreciate it. Also, if you have the means, you can support the show financially at patreon.com slash dicegeeks. And now, today's interview. My guest today is game designer with Explorers Guild Publishing, Richard Davis. Richard, welcome Hello. to the show. Hi, how are you doing? Pretty good. How are you? You know, I'm actually, I've uh, been doing pretty good lately. That's awesome. How were you introduced to tabletop role-playing games? Oh boy. Well, um, my dad was a dungeon master back in, uh, he, he was somewhere in the eighties when he started and I was introduced when I was five years old, which would make it 1993. So I've been playing since I was five. Wow. That is, that is amazing. That is absolutely amazing. Um, uh, cause I always find it interesting now because I run into some people who are, have just started playing with the resurgence of, of yeah. D and the popularity. So that is interesting that you've been playing since you were five. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, what does that do to your mind? Did it warp it or anything? <laughs> <laughs> well, that depends on what publications we're reading. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. um, well, to be perfectly honest, it's like any kind of storytelling it, you know, kind of does. And mm -hmm. that's why humans like it's a species tend to sort of be obsessed with stories from the time they're born till they die. Yeah. It's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So that's interesting um, that your dad played because, uh, you know, I, I started playing when I was nine in, in 1982 mm -hmm. and uh, my dad had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> um, <laughs> he was just like, what, why are you doing this thing with paper and stuff? Like, what are, what are you doing? Like, he just had no idea. So Not that is dad. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's just like, come on, this is the, this is what all the kids are doing in the eighties. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, but that is awesome that your dad was a dungeon master and that he taught you uh, when you were five, of course I'm teaching my kids now and um, right. uh, they're, they're, they're losing it. They, they just love it so much um, mm -hmm. because, uh, because I think like you're, you're right, we're just connected with stories and we just want to tell stories and we're um we're obsessed with them i think <laughs> as a as a species right yes I mean, we are yeah absolutely yeah. if you uh, if you don't think so just ask any random dungeon master what's going on in their dnd &D and they will not stop talking at you yes 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 that is the that is the most dangerous question what are you running these <laughs> days <laughs> it's like oh well it's like this and then oh i forgot to tell you this and then i wrote a, a 150 page backstory for the war of the gods or whatever <laughs> and then See, it's just like on oh uh, i hate to say it but the longest I ever did as a player was only like 30 pages i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> oh as a player wow as a player yeah oh yeah. it's a dm don't don't just don't <laughs> yeah yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, uh, I have, I have gone through phases where I had prepared a lot, and I am now in a phase where I don't really prepare at all. So, um, because I mean, particularly I when you're uh, working with kids, that's yeah. the good way to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you just never know what they're going to say. <laughs> oh right? gosh, no, it's worse than normal people. Who, <laughs> yeah. You will never know what they're going to say in the first place. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you just, um, yeah, you just mentioned something and the, yeah, your kids are just going to do, or they react like a kid would do, right? Like, you know, you're playing mm-hmm. star Wars or something and you're like, Oh, the, the big bounty hunter is standing in the doorway and the kids are like, well, I run away. And you're like, well, that's what you would do in real life. <laughs> absolutely. <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> you know, but it, it, it's a game. You might want to, you know, you might want to take on the bounty hunter or ask him what he's doing, <laughs> but, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, that's that. So that is so cool that you started with, uh, you know, when you were five. So I guess you work then, through some different editions of D&D and uh, learn those in and out? Yeah, um, I have played quite a few role-playing games, some more than others, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, based on the fact I started in 93, obviously I started with uh, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, the yeah. second edition one. Mm-hmm. Then uh, of the other ones I've played, this is as far as I remember all of them, but there's probably one or two more in there. Uh, three and 3.5, quite a bit. That's actually my system of choice, so I tend to when I have a choice, play that one with the uh, players. Uh, Pathfinder is the same thing as 3.5, so that as well. Um, I played Fifth a little bit. Um, I did Gamma World, which is a very unusual one. It's, it's kind of sci-fi in some cases. This particular one was based on 4th edition. Near as I can tell, they kind of keep up with Dungeons & Dragons on that one. Mm-hmm. As for a few weirder ones, there are a couple different Star Wars ones I've tried. This one called Scion. It was really interesting, but terribly balanced i've heard they come out with a second edition on that one hopefully mm-hmm. solve some of those things i'm working on one with a friend right now called tara there was a they did some stuff for pathfinder back in the day and uh mm-hmm. cogent is another one i'm trying out that's pretty new um older ones there was a dragon ball z fusion a long time ago that was a lot of fun not well balanced either uh <laughs> big guys small mouth there was some sort of marvel role-playing system and mm-hmm. i've tried to play pathfinder too it's just hard to find people to play with at the moment okay okay uh it's interesting because um yeah like the uh third edition and 3.5 is kind of a a hole in my dungeon and dragons for me because uh (laughs) i was what was i doing i was doing college and trying to eat and things and it was uh it was hard to uh role play around then um yeah yeah and uh you know um but I did, I did, what was it? A few years ago, I did get Pathfinder and I ran a couple of sessions. I think I ran, well, actually, I think I ran three short kind of test sessions with some friends who wanted to mm-hmm. try it out. And um, it, it worked pretty well. I think, um, you know, I was able to to understand it. I mean, it was just, obviously I had played basic and advanced. So, I mean, it was just like, well, it's Dungeons and Dragons. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, I, I get it. <laughs> I get the concept. So mm-hmm. uh, there so, are yeah. some things that transfer extremely well between versions, usually just like narration, that sort of thing. Yeah. But then the rules, sometimes those are, vastly different (laughs) yeah yeah absolutely why do you you know what kind of draws you to third edition or 3.5 was it just because that's what you played a lot or do you just uh, really like the system well i started out with ad and d and that obviously had a few of its own problems and was my favorite at the time um but when i got into 3.5 there just ended up being like so much like depth you could go with the characters Mm -hmm. not even just counting the splat books just um baseline you could uh have so many different builds is Mm -hmm. what i would uh more or less call them and the there was enough uh play in the monster manual with those things that they were unique enough where i could just sort of come up with as many ideas as i felt like i'm like okay i could just do this this this, this. and then when you add like just a couple homebrew things on there uh it kind of reaches ridiculous levels of what you could just do forever yeah, I haven't quite found that in any future editions of it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, you know, since you started playing when you're five, did you play a long time before you started running your own games? Yes, and yes. Um, mm-hmm. I'd say about eight or nine years before I first tried dungeon mastering. And at the time, I liked being a player more when I tried being a DM. Mm-hmm. And then as time went on, I just kind of switched from one to the other where it was, you know, like hundred percent play at first. Now it's like hundred percent DM and I like it way more. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think that is? Why do you like it more? I think it's because I generally enjoy like uh, directing uh, a group of people like through things. Like I really want them to make their own choices and stuff and I can just react to whatever they're saying, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And 
as they're going, it always gives me something, uh, something, something to think about. Mm-hmm. And I don't really get that as much as a player. Like I will like focus on the game as hard as I can. Like everyone's like saying things. I'm trying to be wrapped up in that with combat. I'm planning my turn, like four turns in advance and listening to whatever it does and try changing it based on that. But at the same time, it only, you can only do so much with that. Whereas when you're the dungeon master, you're running, you know, your six monsters at the same time. And so you're trying to think of what each one of those is going to do. And it's just, it, it keeps me occupied more than being a player does. I would say. Mm-hmm. Okay. No, that's interesting. Um, and so now you just pretty much just all the time game. Almost master? exclusively. Yeah. I, um, I have been a player. Uh, I would say probably two years ago was the la- latest time, maybe a year and a half. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's neat. I, I usually end up being the uh, game master as well, although I'm, I'm taking a break right now and uh, mm-hmm. I'm playing in a three, in a, in a, in a five E campaign. So, uh, right. so it's uh, kind of let me recharge my batteries because I had kind of, uh, uh, GM for about three or so years straight without playing. And so <laughs> it's kind of letting me recharge a little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's, uh, I, I don't know. I just always find it interesting, uh, the way people, certain people take to role playing or, you know, to, to running the game or to, um, uh, to being a player and stuff like that. I just always find it interesting. Uh, yeah. Uh, what people want to choose to do, you know, you'll hear people who are like, well, I GM all the time, but I hate it. And I, would rather play <laughs> and well, then you, <laughs> you know or so you, sad. i know i know you're just like come on you know i mean i i need a break every once in a while but i i do, i i love it that's why i do it right like um yeah. you know you'll just hear different things or you'll hear people who are players and they're like oh no i could never do that because mm-hmm. to to run a game you have to be like a you know a colossus that s- strides the world and knows you know and you have to be jr Tolkien and all this stuff and mm-hmm. you just it's like no no you don't <laughs> you know i haven't invented my own language yet so i'm just not i'm sorry <laughs> yeah yeah exactly it's yeah it's uh, yeah or no like 20 uh, real languages in oh addition. my gosh yeah. <laughs> yeah um but yeah so that's uh that's really interesting and so obviously a lot of people who listen to my podcast they want to you know they're trying to get better at running games and stuff so um mm-hmm. if you don't mind why don't we just dive in a little bit and talk about running games being the dungeon master or game master yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. so um uh maybe just let's start off like um do you, you know if you're going to like start a new campaign how do you start preparing for that well it kind of depends on who my players are. Cause if I'm doing like a pickup group at say a store or something like that, it's mm-hmm. going to end up being way different than if, if it's people I know sure. um, with the uh, store group, I'll probably start out a little bit, you know, more generic. Uh, they talk about, you know, the three pillars of role-playing games with your exploration, your social and your uh, combat. So I would probably, you know, start pretty even on all three of those things. And then based on what the players seem to be reacting to the most, I would probably shift a little bit more in that direction for them. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So you react to your players quite a bit. Oh yeah. Yeah. Which sounds funny that I actually like make modules, but (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah. 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 No, absolutely. I think reacting to your players is, is something that um, certainly it took me way too long to learn and several, you know, possibly lost friendships before I realized (laughs) that you should, uh, that you should react to the players and that they should, you know, uh, be kind of in the world as well. And they should Mm -hmm. enjoy what we're trying to do. So, Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so that's, that's interesting that you, that you start off like that and then, uh, kind of read the group. Is that what you're trying to do and see? Yeah. That's a pretty good way of explaining it. Yeah. And, you also have to be particularly careful with that one, though, because if you shift too far away from something, if there's, say, one of the quieter players that enjoys those things more, mm-hmm. then you're going to get away from them. And you obviously don't want to do that, not to mention the fact that having a difference in kind is also extremely important just to sort of break up the whatever they like the most. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because, yeah, if you yeah, if you enjoy combat, you know, it's still, it's still a, you know, a good break to do something social for a while because Mm -hmm. it it makes the combat feel better. (laughs) Right. 
Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. you also have to be careful because some people have been soured, particularly on one aspect of the role playing experience from previous, you know, campaigns or DMs that were particularly terrible in some way. So you have to mm-hmm. not like immediately issue them, just short, sort of like have good ones for them to be like, oh, hey, that's what exploration is supposed to be like. <laughs> and then uh, yeah. if they still don't like it, okay, move on. But just don't assume from their previous experience that this is what they will like for the rest of their lives. Don't, don't do that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, of course, when I first started, um, I, I started the first time I, I, I DM'd was the only, the second time I had ever played, I played the night before Ooh. and when I was nine and then the ne- I was so fascinated by it the next mm-hmm. day. Um, I ran my mom through a dungeon and okay. and cause I was nine and, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you know, I, yeah, I wasn't like 29 or anything. I was not, right. but, um, I ran my, uh, you know, my mom through a dungeon and, um, I, you know, I didn't know any of the rules or anything. I was just making up stuff and I mm-hmm. was just so fascinated by this world. And, you know, starting from then, you know, I, to, to introduce a lot of my friends to the game, right? Like I had to be the game master, right? I had to be the yes. dungeon master yeah. uh, because it was like, I had heard of it. They are interested in it, but they've never even heard of it. So like, yeah. I, you know, I pretty much have to run the game. Um, and so I, I think I made quite possibly every possible mistake that is, is, you know, available to somebody who's trying to run a game. I, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I railroaded people. I, I took an adversarial role to, oh. to, to the GM. I introduced my own characters into the game. Uh, yeah, these are all extremely common mistakes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I, I did kind of all of that stuff. And I, I, I assume you, that, you know, everybody kind of goes through some, some periods like that, but um mm. What are, you know, um, you know, we don't have to dwell on the negative. What are some positive things that you have learned from running so many games that um, that you 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 would just really like other game masters just to keep in mind as they're as they're running their sessions? Hmm. Well, one of the nice things about tabletop role playing games and Dungeons and Dragons is that they're just so wonderfully modular where if you find something you like in one system, you can very easily port it into another one. And if there's something you think is lacking from the one you're currently playing, throw it in there because there's no reason you can't, assuming your you know players enjoy it, which is kind of the main thing that you have to sort of gauge what you're doing based on. And um, another one that's going to be funny based on what we were just talking about is um, there's nothing that is strictly always bad in a, uh, role-playing games like um Mm -hmm. specifically the one you're talking about when you make your own characters yeah um that is i will grant you it is bad probably 99 percent of the time but (laughs) i've run uh like two player groups before and you can't fill all the roles with that so what i had to do was um they made whatever they wanted which is basically the way you should probably start anyway Mm -hmm. and then based on what they didn't have i just had a multi-class uh, PC go with them. They did not like run the campaign. They had almost nothing to do with the interactions uh, with, you know, other NPCs, that kind of thing. They were just a background character that helped them fulfill the goals that they were trying to accomplish. And again, that's not something that every group would want. Like they mm-hmm. have limited resources with two people. Some people would find it very interesting to try and get around and circumnavigate all these obstacles with very limited resources, but these people didn't. Yeah. Yeah. And I I think you're right there. You know, I think you hit something right there because, um, you know, when you take it to the egregious example and the game master's character is the star of the show and they do all the stuff and they, <laughs> yeah, they're running the game and mm-hmm. I've done this. So I'm, I'm shuddering as I, <laughs> as I say it, because it's awful when you mm-hmm. experience it as a player, it, but yes. I I've done this in the past. And, you know, fortunately I haven't done it since I was like, you know, 13 or 14. So I learned pretty quickly, but, yeah. um, but I think you're, you're right there you know when you're saying like a two player group or another one would be if you're playing you know one on one if you have one you know a game master and one player yeah. mm-hmm. you know they need a buddy right they need somebody yes. to talk to and you know it's just not 
you know, that character just doesn't do, you know, it doesn't find all the clues and it doesn't solve the mystery or anything, yeah. but it's just like, it's just there to give mm-hmm. that player a buddy and a backup, you know, sword or ax or blaster rifle or whatever you need. Or cleric uh, 99% of the time. Yeah. Or cleric. <laughs> that is always, <laughs> that is always handy to have uh, a friend who's a cleric, obviously. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so I, I think you're right too because um, and I think you could take that to other topics like you're saying it's not always bad it just depends on how the person uses it because like you could take railroading your players as another example sometimes you know if you're talking like at the beginning of a campaign yeah that's can, when I would generally yeah. say particularly like the very first session when you start you kind of have to that's that's how they get there how they're how you force them together if they don't know each other absolutely absolutely and that's what I was just going to ask you too. And um, I I think that's, you know, something that we forget about when we say, Hey, don't railroad your players. We don't necessarily mean the first 15 minutes of that first session, that first, you know, first 15 minutes, you're like, okay, you're all together because of this and you've all done this and you're all friends now and you're all this (laughs) and you're, and Oh no, this thing happens. And you're just like, well, Oh, well you just railroaded us. Well, yeah, but I have in the past done it where the players didn't know each other. I didn't force them to know each other. And it is a mess because they have no reason to stick together. And five minutes in, I was like, what have I done? Why did I do this? (laughs) Oh my gosh. That is like one of the worst mistakes. I, I, and I don't know how many times it took me to realize not to do that. Um, Like, uh, because uh, the, the the idea of if if the listeners out there are you know when you when you start the campaign if your players don't know each other you you would almost have to expect like three or four sessions before they trust each other right like yeah and it doesn't work it just doesn't work um and you know I, I mean unless I guess some players if they all just realize they need to work together and they just do it because they've played other role-playing games, but yes, you, you can get away with it there. You can get away with it there, but still, I think it's still a failure failure on the GM's part because um, you're opening up a can of worms because as soon mm-hmm. as, as soon as somebody's having a bad day or a chip on their shoulder or saying like, Oh, well, my, you know, my, my paladin, you know, or my, my dwarf paladin is kind of surly. And as soon as he makes like a little insult to the uh to the elf who's all uppity or whatever then yeah. they're just like well i'm not traveling with this person or whatever and you're just like yeah. guys no you're supposed to be <laughs> like why like, didn't i just say you're ball out of control so fast <laughs> oh my gosh so fast well i think i i'm trying i'm remembering back to a star wars session where i did that and you know, it, and this was like at a time where we had limited time and I, I don't even know what I was thinking. Like, you know, somebody, you know, we were young and, you know, we were working different hours and stuff and somebody has to be to work at midnight and stuff. And we're trying to get a session in. And for some reason I didn't do, I didn't have them all know each other. And mm-hmm. it, the session just like spirals out of control. Nothing happens. And at the end of like three hours, the, the, all the, the players are like holding guns at each other, you know, and you're just like, what just happened? Like this wasn't yeah. even fun and nobody enjoyed it <laughs> and nobody trusts each other. And you're just like, why did this turn into a big, you know, PVP kind of thing? And, you yeah. know, and it was like, all I could have said was, Hey, you're, you're all friends now and let's play. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Actually, PVP is another one that some people will swear to their grave is the worst thing in the world. But in a few instances, if you, you know, do it right, it's actually a, a very advanced thing. Please don't do this your first time yeah. DMing, but um, you can uh, make it work out. So it's actually really good as far as the story goes. Mm-hmm. No, I agree with that too. Um, It's one of those things where you, you might caveat it like you did before and say like 99% of the time, let's just, you know, not worry about it, but like Mm -hmm. you can. And, um, and actually in our campaign right now, I'm, my character is, 
is uh, a good character and that we have a druid in the party who is chaotic neutral and my character is starting to get a little frustrated with this druid who yeah like he just keeps on a whim like helping our enemies maybe or helping our friends because oh he's just doing his own thing and so uh. my character is a little <laughs> frustrated with him but I, I i make it clear you know to the to the other player and to the the game master it's like i'm not upset like at anybody right like i'm playing my character and yeah. i'm just saying like He's a little frustrated with the guy. He's not, you know, angry or anything, but like, you know, he's just yeah. frustrated with like, why is he acting like this? You know, we're supposed to be helping these people. And he's just, I'm the neutral spirit of the forest kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And just, um, you yeah. know, and so it can be done and it can be fun. And I think we're all having fun with it. That's the, that's the key. When somebody's, you know, when somebody's getting upset, that's you're, mm-hmm. you're doing something wrong. If somebody's upset. Yeah. In yeah. general, I've found that the worst kind of PvP is the kind where players just up and attack each other. Yeah. And the best kind is where they secretly betray each other behind their backs. And then the very last session in the campaign, they are on the enemy's team. Then they're like, it's actually part of the climax of the entire story where they're turning on one another. That yeah. works out real well. But again, the people have to like think about it and not let the people know out of game either. It's much more complicated. Yeah, yeah, it is complicated. And yeah, and you have to pull it off. Um, you know, like I said, like, um, you know, or, you know, if you have a new player, an experienced player, and you start, yeah. argue, you know, like you start arguing in character with like this new player's character, they, yeah. they're they they're not separating the fact that you're playing a role, you know, or maybe or something yet. And yeah, just, and like you said earlier, letting them know that you're this is just your character, like saying these things, you're not actually mad. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. I, yeah. It's I just have like seen people who cannot separate it and that yeah. is, just, they're not fun to play with. No, no, no. And, uh, no. Um, and yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I, I think just, you just have to be on the same page a lot, you know, you yes. just have to, you know, just kind of understand what you're, what you're trying to do and that, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, and it, it is interesting. I mean, it is, um, and, uh, you know, maybe you can speak to this a little bit since you GM a lot. I know there are a number of people, and of course, uh, I was going to say now, uh, but I haven't been to a con in a while because they all been canceled. But um, when I had started <laughs> going to some, you know, more and more conventions and since obviously I self publish role playing games, uh, you know, books and um, yeah. I'm doing panels and presentations and talk to people yeah. at my table and stuff. Um, I meet a lot of people who are just like, oh, you know. I, you know, I'd really love to run my own game. You know, I'd love to run my own campaign or just a few sessions because, you know, I've been playing for a while and then they're, then they go on and I was like, Oh, well, what, what's your idea for your campaign? And then they just start reeling off this stuff. And you're like, well, that sounds amazing. Why won't you run it? And they're just like, they'll say something along the lines of like, Oh, it's, 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 it's too much, or it's a big deal, or I'll make mistakes or, or <laughs> things like that. What would, what would you say to somebody who, who says like, Oh, it's too big of a job or I would mm-hmm. mess it up. <laughs> okay. Well, the first and everyone friendly piece of advice is first of all, you're going to mess up. You're going to mess up every time I mess up. You know, I, yeah. I've been doing this for over 15 years on the DM side. I still continue to mess up, but at the same time, you do get better the more you do it. Yeah. If that campaign is so incredibly sacred to you that you can't possibly like make fumbles while doing it, first, mm-hmm. you'll never run it. Second, yes. you should probably like try something smaller first, DM first, and then after you've got some experience, then you can do your thing. But you'll also, if it's that important to you, you'll need to find players that will work with you on it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I... I think sometimes we just psych ourselves out because like, we've just been talking, like, you know, when I started running games, I I've made every mistake, right? Like I've Mm -hmm. made terrible mistakes. I have, I, 
did things that angered people, like truly angered friends, you know, good friends of mine because, and I was being a jerk. Right. And I was just, I was just, or I was just plain, didn't know how to do it, it, you know, and it took a while to get some of those things out. So Mm -hmm. I, I I do like your advice there. I I say, start with something and start with something small. Like, you know, if you have a regular DM and, and they're like, Hey guys, you know, I'm going to have to cancel the session uh, because I got a work thing or a family thing, just yeah. volunteer to run a one shot. And yeah, it can, it can be level one characters in a tavern, getting into a bar fight, right? Like it can just yeah. be anything. And usually people who love to play are just like, Oh, well, that sounds fun. You know, why yeah. not? You know? And mm-hmm. you know, you don't have to do, you know, the, the, the God's war with the, you know, 10,000 years of backstory or, or anything yes. like that, you know, you're the first time you're going to try, you mm-hmm. know, running a game <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. And this will, this will also sound uh, a bit odd, but if the, if the story you want to tell also has to go a particular way, just write a book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And and secretly, we all know that all game masters are novelists <laughs> um, uh, that, we, that we want. To oh, be. I feel personally attacked. I oh, do have oh, a novel. <laughs> oh, so do I. So do I. So I wrote a novel. I, I just published my novel in June of 2021. So oh, nice. Yeah, my first one. So, uh, yeah. So you have a novel as well? Yeah, I uh, actually got a publisher to read it. He said, uh the beginning needs work because I wrote this over such a long period of time, but he's like, but the end is really good. So if you just bring up the beginning to the end, then yeah, it'll, it'll be fine. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's awesome. So it's not yeah. published yet, but you're, you're working no, it's on it. No, it's not published yet. Okay, cool. Um, no, that's awesome. And it, this just kind of goes along with my thing. I, I believe uh, you could count, I could count on my fingers how many, uh, game masters that I've interviewed on this podcast are not novelists or have not <laughs> dreamed of writing a novel or have not, right. you know, or don't have a desk drawer or a computer files filled with the beginnings of novels, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and then of course, some I've interviewed have multiple novels and are very successful at it, but it's just, yeah. uh, I, I think there's some connection there that the game masters that to run a game, you just have to love stories and you just want to tell stories. And yeah, it, that's and, really the biggest part honestly yeah absolutely and we're drawn to tell stories you know Mm -hmm. we're just so drawn to tell stories so we're writing novels um Mm -hmm. also a number of people that i've interviewed including myself have had a background in filmmaking and yeah and i find that that is kind of interesting too because um when I was young and naive and I went to college, I thought I could do anything in the world. And so I studied film and then I okay. graduated and I needed to eat food. And um, who'd have thought? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I needed like protection from like rain. And so um uh so yeah, uh that didn't that didn't, you know, I I mean I made some movies, but they're they're kind of crazy. And um oh yeah, but it was just like I wanted to, you know, I just had to tell stories, right? And that was something that I I realized when I was nine years old, I guess, when I played Dungeons and Dragons for the first time. Um, but um, I, I know I'm getting on some tangents there, but um, <laughs> it just talking about, you know, um, it, I think it all started when I said we were secretly all novelists or we we're yes. just out in the open novelists. <laughs> as I published <laughs> mine in June. Um, right. Um, because I, I, you know, and in my thing is too, that like, I think, a lot of players, even people who have played a long time and haven't run games, I think they're in the same boat as well, right? They're creating a character because they want yeah. a story around that character. Um, you know, and especially the tip off is I think you said earlier, 30 pages or something for a you know, for a character <laughs> one time. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> Yeah, when you're, you know, when your your player shows up and you're like, hey, you know, we're just playing a really quick game tonight. And, mm-hmm. you know, hopefully you just made, you know, kind of level three characters. I'm just going to throw some stuff at them. And you say, well, what do you make? And they just like talk for 10 minutes. They and you're go. like, you know, we're only playing like two sessions with these characters. Right. And you're just like, yeah. I know, but I can't help myself. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um, real quick thing. Absolutely. Make all that backstory for yourself. Don't give it all to your DM. They're busy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just tell me if their sister disappeared or their yeah, mom, I can you know, use. their mom was a yes, traveling 
performer mm-hmm. or something. Just tell me some, you know, a few bits I can use. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I regret giving that all to my DM. That was my <laughs> bad. One of those early mistakes I made. You will make less mistakes and they'll be smaller to the point where people won't think you're making mistakes anymore for the most part, which is great. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're micro mistakes you make by the end, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and you said something that was important to a while back. It's just like, you know, I've been running games now since, you know, I was nine years old. Um, I give away, I give away my age all the time on the podcast anyway. So I don't know why I I usually don't, you know, say it. So I'm 47 and Mm -hmm. I've been running games since I was nine with a few breaks in there. And I have run, I I can't even count, you know, now how many systems I've run, you know, at least one or two games, you know, I mean, probably a dozen, more than a dozen, I would imagine easily. And, um, you know, the last time I was running a game a few months ago, wrapping up our big campaign that was taking like a year and a half, I realized like I made just like a couple mistakes. Like I forgot a few things. I forgot to describe something that was in the environment that the players needed. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it just happens. I mean, we're, you know, we, we have, you know, we have lives, we get tired. <laughs> we, you know, if it's 1030 now, I'm kind of tired. And so I'm, yeah. you know, I just try to generate an entire world on the spot as people are asking questions and you're like, well, didn't think about that. Oop, here's the answer. Yeah. You're gonna make some mistakes. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think, you know, that's a, just a, so, so important for, you know, when, when we're a you know player to remember that the GM is just a person who, you know, who is as busy as I am or, mm-hmm. or, you know, and, you know, but they have to answer, you know, a thousand and four questions tonight where I, I, every 15 minutes get like a 10 minute break because somebody else is doing something, you yeah. know, you know, and um, I think we can just, you know, if we're, you know, I, I get playing sometimes, you know, online with strangers or at a con with strangers, can be can be a little weird for some people but if you're playing with your friends and mm-hmm. you know some family members uh they better just understand that you're gonna make mistakes and it's all good <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. i mean they will likely mock you a little bit but they don't mean well, it. it's fine <laughs> yeah i mean mocking you know if as long as it's you know friends you know friendly yeah, fr- kind of, friendly mocking <laughs> yeah that's fine because and i still get that right i mean there are sessions that happened you know 15 years ago that somebody will remind me of hey you remember that time when you totally botched this rule and said my character was dead or whatever and then yeah then like 15 to after arguing for a few minutes and looking it up, realizing that you totally made a mistake. And you're like, yes, yes, I remember that. Sorry. Um, we, <laughs> we fixed it. <laughs> you know, nothing's, nothing's ruined. Everything's fine. But yes, I do remember. Yeah. That. <laughs> There's actually one that um, I feel really bad about and is technically a very minor thing. But um, mm-hmm. so my wife, the first time I role played with her, she played a druid, which in and of itself was a terrible mistake because druids are probably the most complicated class. At least they were in three, five when you had an animal companion and spells. But um, <clears throat> she said, Hey, I want to attack that guy's eyes with my Raven. And there were like, there were very bad rules for this back in the day. And they were also, you know, like not in standard rules. I was trying to keep it simple. I was like, you can't really do that. I should not have said that. That was, yeah. Her first session, I should have just let it just make up a roll on spot. She wouldn't have power gained with it. It should have, would have been fine. Yes. And that was like 12 years ago that happened. And I still feel terrible about it. <laughs> Yeah, that's the that's the big one. Um, kind of shutting down a new player. Um, yeah, because most new players are not trying to game the system in some way. Um, yeah, very rarely will you find like a you know somebody who's never played before who's like, oh, can I do this thing that gives me an advantage over everybody else? They're just trying to think of something cool. Right? Yeah, I'm used to playing yeah. with those people. That was the problem. Yes. Yeah. And so you're like, no, you can't do that um, <laughs> because it could get out of hand with like game mm-hmm. balance or whatever and power. And then that person's just looking at you going, oh, so I can't do anything in your game. And you just told me I could do like whatever I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and actually, it's kind of funny. It happened actually with my wife. Fortunately, I wasn't the GM, but a friend okay. of ours a friend of ours was GMing our group and my wife was playing, I think for the first time with us uh, some years back. And he said she couldn't do something. And 
every once in a while to this day, I'll be talking about, well, I talk about role-playing games all the time. So I'll be talking about role-playing games and my wife will say something and I'm like, are you still bitter that he wouldn't like let you move the furniture around in your, in your, uh, we were playing Star Trek and it was like, she couldn't move the furniture around in her quarters for some reason. That's just and, weird. <laughs> I know. And so she's like, yeah. I am still bitter that he wouldn't let me move the furniture in my quarters, you know, on the, <laughs> and you're just like, Oh, okay. Well, uh, the next time we play together and I'm the GM, I'm pretty much going to just let her do whatever she wants. <laughs> mm-hmm. you know? And a little bit on the same vein, um, in order to help yourself grow as a GM more than anything else, just try new things. Every time you have a campaign, Yeah, like, yeah. Every time I do, I would try out a new rule or a big old like overhaul of this or try to focus more on that. It's one of the things that helps you grow more than anything else. And letting people move the furniture, maybe that's somewhere to start. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I try to do that as well. Like if I um if I have a campaign where you're gonna travel like overland for a long journey, I'll I'll try to do a couple different ways of handling that. I'll just yeah. wave my hand and you're there, or I'll have some different encounters or something, you know, yeah. I'll just try a different method and yeah. see, see what works. You know, sometimes, you know, it, it works. Sometimes the players get distracted sometimes. And then you're just like, Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to do this thing, which is maybe a combination between, you know, a and C, but I'm going to throw B out the window because my players hated that, or I hated that or something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that's great advice too, that you should, um, should really uh, just try new things and try them out and see what happens. And then, yeah. you know, just learn from that or, you know, when you're playing, watch what your GM is doing. And if they're doing something that's really cool and really interesting, yes, you know, just <laughs> note that. And if something, if you're sitting there and the game is boring and you, you're not sure why, see what your, your game master is doing and maybe they're yeah. struggling with something and, or, you know, or maybe it's the players aren't being active or, or something that is just like, what, why is this game going wrong? Why is this game going good? I mean, just mm-hmm. asking yourself some just very simple and basic questions questions can really help you yeah it's funny you mentioned uh exploration was the thing you were trying to work on with your current campaign because for the longest time i was a really good combat dm and not that great with exploration and okay with role-playing so at one point in my campaign basically at the end the entire world ended up getting reshaped because lots of cataclysmic events happened there were like new islands new this wild magic was everywhere there was just like all kinds of new stuff Uh so i said okay next campaign i'm going to focus on exploration and getting better at that so what i did was i then like would have entire sessions where they didn't actually fight anything which was very new for me Mm -hmm. and I would just like have to describe the scenery, what they were finding. And I had to make it interesting where they didn't get combat rewards or fighting or even talking to people sometimes where I just try to have the entire time just focusing on this. And it's some people's favorite campaign that I've run. So Mm -hmm. you just have to try out new things and get better at them because I'm sure it wasn't their favorite at first. (laughs) Yeah. And I, I think sometimes too, that, um, well, I mean, we can all get into ruts, right? I mean, you can have players who are like, I just love combat. I just love it. I just love it. And yes. then, mm-hmm. um, of course they do, but like you introduce something and there's a lot of role playing or, and then they're just like, man, that session was great. I just didn't realize I loved role playing like that, you know? Yeah. And uh, so, I mean, always trying something new, trying, you know, trying something out, uh, uh, you know, expanding our horizons. So yeah, if, if you're mm-hmm. combat heavy, try to do, you know, some social stuff, mm-hmm. try to, you know, do some exploration stuff, try to, you know, or if you're, if you're always have your players, you know, you know, doing court intrigue and, and stuff, <laughs> then, you know, try and maybe break that out and have them do a heist or something. And, you know, yeah. Oh, heist could be so much fun. I should oh, probably make a, Oh, that'd be so hard to make a module of my gosh. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. uh, one thing that I've found mm-hmm. is like one of the most rewarding things you can do as far as like player engagement is concerned mm-hmm. is character development for characters, not like their stats or anything that just happens. It's, you know, kind of blossom background, mm-hmm. but like, a character like growing from one person to another over the course of a campaign. Oh yeah. People just love that stuff, but it is so hard. First of all, because you have to entertain everyone and character development happens to one or two people at a time, usually. Mm-hmm. And 
for the players also have to buy into it. Like if they start out as grumpy dwarf and they want to play grumpy dwarf, that character is not changing. <laughs> you have to find people <laughs> who are willing to be dynamic. They have to not die because that ru- that eliminates all the character <laughs> development, but you have to have death there. So it's actually a threat. It's really hard to balance these things, but if you can pull it off, it's amazing. And people will never want to play in another person's sessions. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree with that. And I think, um, I think, you know, some players don't realize how, how powerful that can be. Yeah. Um, but I, I think there is a mistake there. I think um, sometimes people will make the mistake of coming into the first session and saying, hey, this is this arc that I'm going to take my character yes. on. Mm-hmm. Like it's a novel or a TV show that's all planned out. Yeah. And I, I think that can be a mistake. But I think yes. if you start seeing some things, because, well, I mean, that's actually happening to me. I'm playing a character now and I didn't really foresee him changing too much but just certain events have started happening and i'm just like oh i'm gonna kind of lean into this and i'm gonna you know he's gonna change and um and so far you know i'm like my you know my game master and you know the the friends that i'm playing with are like this is this is wild you know your Mm -hmm. character is like you know used to be this quiet you know big guy with a sword and now he's doing all kinds of different stuff you know and um and it's just well it's just like i've been hit with all this really cool stuff from our game master so he he can't stay the same right Mm -hmm. the from what i've found the best way to do it is take a few sessions and figure out what the players are all like their character does this that kind of thing this is who they are and then after that if they're good role players that's kind of a requirement in this case Mm -hmm. like to have their character and put them in situations where their characters like morals would be tested or where it's especially difficult for them something about their character you have to challenge And if they stick with that, okay, move on to something else. If they don't, they've experienced some character development and then just like subtly just sort of shift that over time. And then eventually their character will be like a different person from when they started. They might be a better person. They might be a worse person. Either one is interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I I completely agree. I completely agree. Um, And, you know, I, I, I think, uh, you know, like I said, some players are, are surprised, like if you're playing with a group that really enjoys combat or mm-hmm. or ex- exploration, I think they're surprised when you kind of hit them with that moral dilemma or, um, you know, kind of situation that would push them, you know, out of the neutral into a lawful or into a, you know, a chaotic kind of mold yeah. or something. And usually I find players like, you know, like that are like, that was an awesome session because like, yeah. I just, you know, I, I had to think about all this stuff, like, but not like, you know, how, you know, not like thinking about, you know, how my fireball does X or how my, you know, my mm-hmm. ax does this or, you it's know, or whatever damage I can get from placing this in this location. Exactly. It was thinking about like acting like a person right is yeah. really pushing <laughs> that role right it's so funny that that's the thing that people don't think about the most <laughs> i know it, it happens but then you know I, and i mean I, I i guess that's a, a legit because especially if you have a new player and mm-hmm. you're just like okay look at all this stuff here's you know here's a 5e character sheet or yeah or D&D beyond or whatever well what are you focused on you're focused on yeah. i can cast eldridge blast and i can you know i can do this so you come into that first session you know, with just like, oh, okay, I'm going to use my dagger and I am going to mm-hmm. use my spell and I'm going to use this. And then you're like, oh, you're expecting me to really act like this person. I think, yeah, I think it's just normal. Um, you know, um, it, actually, now that you mention it, I think it might be the way we're introducing people to the game because you want them to, you know, to be able to play the game. Like, here are the rules. Here's how you do this. But there are very few, you know, rules based on role playing because there shouldn't be. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But I think it, you know, may be better for the players overall to just say, hey, we're playing this, just play along. And then, like, if there's a die roll that comes up, absolutely tell them the die roll. But, mm-hmm. like, just don't get them so focused on the rules in the first place. Get them focused on role playing the role playing game first. Yeah. And, uh, I- yeah, but I, 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 you know, I, I, I totally agree with you, but I think it just gets, I think there's just a, you know, it kind of just gets slanted that way because especially if they're making their character for the first time, right? yeah, because it's just like, well, 
here's the rule. How do I make a character? Oh boy. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Or it's just like, well, don't worry about it. Um, Well, you have to worry about it. You know, you do, you do, you know, like you make the character, you're going to get attached to it. That's kind of the way it works. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, but then, you know, some people, I guess it doesn't have, I guess it may depend on how rules heavy the system is or, yeah. um, or they're just their thoughts. You know, if it takes a while to make the character, then it's like, Oh God, you know, it's like, Oh yeah, I got him. He's a warlock and he's this and that. And then you're like, Oh, what's his name? And you're like, Oh gosh, I forgot. I didn't give him a name. You know, it's <laughs> like, it was just like, I was just all consumed by trying to get this, you know, this, uh, you yeah. know, all the rules, right. And you, you kind of miss it. So I, maybe, a a different, different, you know, something that's a little bit more rules light or something you could think about it a little bit more or Mm -hmm. just really trying to ask questions. I I always try to ask questions of my players. If, if we're all making characters or if they're going to go away and make characters, I just try to always give them some kind of questions and stuff. Just Mm -hmm. like, well, what were you before? Why are you doing this now? Why is this happened? do you have this, you know, and you get some crazy answers and sometimes you do get 30 pages back. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yes. But um, one thing I've found that I like to do quite a bit is um, I will always get backstories from people and based on what they are, everyone will get like unique rewards. As I said, I uh, play mostly three, five, sometimes it might be like extra hit points, extra skill points in this specific skill, or I might give them like an attack that only they can do that kind of thing. And What's really nice is it has encouraged people to try like very, very different backgrounds because how many players have you had that their player was killed by their, their parents were killed by bandits and they're, they're on revenge and like, just always like, is your family dead? Yep. Okay. You family dead. Yep. Okay. You. And then it just kind of goes on that way. And I eventually I said, okay, next person who has their family killed by bandits, you have a plus five to hit bandits and that's what you get. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that that does seem very to be very common, but I I, I think it's because a little, a lot of the movies and a lot of the fiction that we yeah. get, or um, you know, if you you know, I grew up watching eighties action movies. Well, you got to have some reason why you're out adventuring. You know, you yeah. you know, Rambo wouldn't be Rambo if he wasn't like traumatized in some yeah. way, right? <laughs> you know, um, there's character there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So so and you know, and that's usually just a pretty pretty good go-to right but um uh, I, I what i really hate is the players who do that so i don't have anything to use as a game master yeah you know? I, mm-hmm. like yeah. haha I, all my family's dead you can't use it against me i'm like well i can't make a good story with them either yeah exactly that's what that's when i hate it right that's when mm-hmm. you're just like no, you're, you're being, you're being unreasonable now. Like, you're just not, you know, cause if, you know, the character's like, Oh no, if I say my aged mother is a widow living in this town, you know, she's going so, to be kidnapped by bandits or whatever. Yeah. And you're like, that's totally what's going to happen. But like, you know, <laughs> you should just let it because it's going to be a good story. All right. It's like, going to be a good story. Exactly. One, exactly. One I had a player who we were like, was actually open to character development and had a pretty good backstory that he didn't tell me all at once. Thank goodness. But um, by the end of this campaign, it was like, like two, two and a half years, something like that. Mm-hmm. He was just like, so inspired by his camp uh, entire campaign. He actually started a like graphic novel of all these things. He's a very good artist. Wow. So it's like super cool. He hasn't released any of it yet, but I'm encouraging him to do so. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And like we said earlier, I think people who play just want to tell stories too. I think we're we're all just, you know, wanting to tell stories. Well, now, you know, Richard, I've been rambling for like ever. We haven't even talked about what you do, uh, you know, too much and create. I get talking about role-playing games and I get distracted. So I introduced you as a game designer (laughs) uh, uh, with Explorers Guild Publishing. Why don't you tell us a little about Explorers Guild Publishing? Okay, well, uh, it is a thing that I started, so I'm kind of the only person working for it. Everybody else is like freelance art, basically, because I don't art. I am so bad at it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And funny story, the Explorers Guild publishing the name came from that campaign where everyone was sailing around on boats and like exploring the world. The Explorers Guild was a place that you would like tell people Like, I found this in this place. I think it might have these uses. Then they would send people out, and then it would be a new discovery. So this is how cannons are eventually introduced into the world. But anyway, so, like, it it was the Explorer's Guild, and I was like, hey, I'll just, like, throw publishing on the end. Then it's my thing. I make D&D content under this stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, nice, nice. Mm-hmm. So what have you been releasing under that banner? Well, I have a bunch of stuff on Drive Through RPG. I'm sure there's a link somewhere. Um, mm-hmm. I have done several modules at this point. There are three, I think. Uh, the first was Hawkwood Hideout. It was the first one I ever wrote. I wanted to be for like new players, new DMs. So there's actually pre-made characters in the back if people have no idea what's going on. But um, it's just a really simple story that still has a lot of like player agency. Um, small thing to investigate, like just very easy stuff that you can kind of get into. And it has like, different ways that it can be used if the players take one or two other actions. So player accountability exists and like their choices matter. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, After that, there is uh, uh, a plea from the dark, which is like semi horror themed. We're, you know, getting close to Halloween. That's nice. And it, that one involves more role playing. And then the other one, because the first one's been pretty balanced between all of them. And that one is about going to a mountain town uh, finding out that there's like nightmares that everyone's having and everyone is f- trying to figure out why this is happening, but they can't. So they just, you have to sort of put this together, go that direction. A lot of fun. And yeah. the third one I actually kickstarted, which was the first thing I'd ever done on Kickstarter, which was oddly successful. People were very interested in it. Um, it is a uh, mystery horror game where you have to go to this Island and figure out what's going on. And there are just so many pieces you uh, end up putting together. And the thing I had to be really careful about that one is mystery is so hard where you have to have like multiple ways for the players to understand something. Mm -hmm. And you can't rely on people to like make perception checks because there is some group somewhere. Everyone's going to roll a one. It's the worst. But yeah, that one is a mystery horror where you have to sort of untangle this giant knot with a whole bunch of things that are going on at the same time. And I've had so much good response from that one. My gosh, it's been great. And those are the adventures I've made thus far. Uh, that one's called Wolves of Stedwick, by the way. Um, Wolves of Stedwick. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I guess just because you've been running games, it's just been kind of an outpouring that now you've wanted to start publishing. Yeah, basically. Mm-hmm. And it's not just adventures. There's like a couple other things I've tried out. One of the, uh, I made some uh, extra feats for fifth edition. I only threw that one on Dungeon Masters Guild just to see how well things sell there comparatively. Not as well. So that's kind of just sitting on its own and it's over in the corner. Uh, There's one, however, that did pretty well. Um, It's called Gaming and Gambling. It's actually system agnostic. So if you're playing like Starfinder, you can use it. D&D, Marvel, who cares? Uh, It's basically just a whole bunch of like tavern games that you can play with people. It just gives instructions for how to play those so often when people in taverns they say i want to uh do some gambling so you just have them roll each one you roll one do you roll higher okay you won good job here's a gold and that's mm-hmm. kind of boring so there's just i think it's 15 different games in here where you can actually like have a bet and has its own rules and the players can actually play it themselves it's really fun oh well that's really that sounds really cool um uh so yeah, so um, uh, well, I mean that's absolutely true, right? I mean you're like, oh, I gamble, and you're just like, as a as a game master, I'm like, no, oh, don't gamble, <laughs> right? Like I don't know what to do. Um, well, there do, you go. <laughs> yeah, I know. So uh, that's uh, that's a really good one. Or I I could just break out a deck and start dealing blackjack. That you know, uh, like I don't even know yeah. what I need to do, right? So that's really cool. That um, um, this, so it's like a mini game inside the game. Then yeah. So I, I, I really like that. I, I, I like that a lot um, um, because that can really uh, that can really fit into some people's characters when they make a character that's like, well, I, I go to taverns and I gamble like I'm a professional gambler. And you're just like, I have no mechanism for your mm-hmm. profession. That doesn't yeah. work. That doesn't work well. <laughs> that doesn't yeah. Work so well. you get your guy is like, oh, I don't feel like playing poker tonight. Let's play Sand Pillars or Chains of Fate. It's like all these different games that they have, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that's awesome. So that sounds really cool. And so, um, um, you know, as you mentioned, they're available on uh, drive through and dungeon uh, uh, on the DMs guild. And, yeah, um, but I would stick with drive through because as I said, there's only the one on oh, DMs okay. guild. So don't, don't even bother. Really. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I've, I've only released one title on the DMs guild as well. Um, mm-hmm. It's a, it's a different, uh, 
a different beast that I, uh, yeah. that I don't know if I want to uh, tame <laughs> at the moment. Oh. But um, um, One quick thing that I should probably mention the wolves mm-hmm. of Steadwick, the mystery horror, that mm-hmm. one is not for new dungeon masters. It's much more advanced than the other ones. So absolutely give it a look if you have played for a while but if you're a new player stick with the other two okay and then uh you did mention the problem that there is with like mysteries in in lots of games you know you Mm -hmm. you know uh you have all your players in a room and you're like roll perception and everybody rolls a two (laughs) and you you, well you can't just have them stand in a room How, how did you kind of solve that problem well Um, so, you know, in all of those shows where everyone's trying to show how crazy this person is with their conspiracy theory. So they have a big old cork board and these red lines that are going from place to place. And there's like 50 different three by five cards, all that, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I did that to plan this thing out because I had to find two to three ways to make players have like, uh, to reach one of the major clues for them. So if they fail the perception there, who cares? There's something they can actually figure out with their brain thoughts over here. And then this way, if you talk to this person, they might say this and that will help you get there. So I had to just like go full conspiracy mode on this to figure out 500 different ways they could solve this thing while making them subtle enough. So it's not actually just super obvious. Like, Oh, it was that guy. <laughs> Well, that sounds incredible. I have not tackled a mystery. I'll tell you that, uh, like writing one. Um, mm-hmm. it, so that sounds awesome. Um, what kind of does the future hold? Are you still, obviously you said you kickstarted something. So this means like, you're really going to kind of go into this is the future hold more and more content coming up. Yeah. I'm going to keep trying to put a lot of stuff out. My wife is actually a teacher. She it gives us the aforementioned food and ceiling that you were talking about, which is fantastic. So I'm trying to make this a full-time thing because she loves our kids to death and I don't blame her. So do I, but (laughs) we're hoping at some point this will be, you know, like a full-time thing to where she can just stay home with them and I can write stuff because, Oh my gosh, I love stories. But anyway, uh, so funny story on the story writing. I was actually on Kickstarter again, somewhat recently. Uh, Mm -hmm. My brother is a computer programmer. So we are actually making a visual novel that was successfully funded. Oh, wow. So that's something I'm working on. As soon as my part is done in that, I'm going to uh, have another adventure on Kickstarter because the first one just went stupid well, just really, really well received and everyone just seemed to have a blast with it. So I'm going to be throwing up another one probably in about four or five months. So actually probably pretty soon to uh, when this episode actually releases yeah. as you were talking yeah. about. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's awesome. I have not tried Kickstarter yet. Um, I, uh, um, I've looked into it. I've talked to some people about it. I think I even emailed some of the people who work there and Mm -hmm. I am not doing it yet. (laughs) Um, uh, just, uh, I I don't know. So much study of that stupid website before I finally threw something. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I, I, I've looked into it quite a bit myself and I'm just like, I I don't know. I don't know. (laughs) Um, um, because I mean, if, if, if I do, I will do something, very low, like, you know, just like a couple hundred dollars or something low so I can just get it and see, hopefully it'll, yeah. it'll fund. Or I, I like think that. the goal on my first one was $750, which was a little bit high for uh, yeah. D&D adventures, but I was like, ah, this is something people probably interested. I got like 1700 bucks because wow. everyone's like, whoa, mystery. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. That yeah. Is really cool. That is mm-hmm. really cool. Um, so that is really cool. And um, yeah. And congratulations. I know sometimes it can be rough uh, uh, on Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, oh. art was more expensive than I thought it would be. So. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> oh, um, one quick thing to anyone who's thinking about publishing bad art is worse than no art. So if you <laughs> don't have an artist, Just put the title on the front with like a nice looking board or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Don't put terrible art you made yourself. Just don't do that. I did it. It was the wrong choice (laughs) for obviously the Hawkwood hideout, not the mold aesthetic. Yeah. I paid somebody for that one. It looks gorgeous. Yeah. And uh, there is, you know, well, obviously I self-publish as well. So I I completely agree. Um, I would say um, do not, do not underestimate stock art. Um, Yes, that too. I've, recently yeah. discovered that it is so nice. Yes. And um, I know some people don't like it, but I, 
I don't, uh, you know, I don't like those people. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, those three to 4% of people can just cry their salty tears as the other 96% of people are like, Hey, that looks good. Yeah, exactly. Everybody <laughs> else is like, uh, cause I show people stock art and they're like, that's amazing. How much did you pay for that? And I'm like, like five bucks. I don't know. <laughs> I know exactly. I'm like $5 and, or, or that one was a uh, dollar 25 sometime yeah. when I got for a dollar 25 and people are just like, no way. That's amazing. And you're just like, yeah, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. The um, back cover for Wolves of Stedwick was absolutely beautiful, but the the person I ended up paying like 150 bucks for, I was like, oh no, what have I done? <laughs> That's half my art budget. <laughs> oh, gosh. oh gosh. And this one's like the, the other two I mentioned are one shot. This one is impossible to tell because it is a mystery, sure. but I've heard uh, people taking between like 12 hours with it and 33 hours. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome though. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's awesome really for a game master. If you, if you get materials that, that you can just, you know, keep using and people are having fun with, um, yeah. that is, that is really cool. So mm -hmm. 33 hours, that's, that's a pretty long, that's a pretty long. Yeah. It's yeah. like 50 something pages. It's got side quests and most of what's nice. in it is like role-playing stuff. There's obviously some, you know, combat because yes, but if it's a horror, please, please, please don't make combat the correct answer in every instance. That is yeah. not horror anymore. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that sounds awesome. And I will be uh, sure to put links to all of your adventures in the show notes for this episode at mm -hmm. dicegeeks.com. So anybody who is listening right now can head over to dicegeeks.com, find the show notes for this episode, and you will find links to Richard's adventures um, there. Well, Richard, um, I mean, I could just still keep asking you questions all night and all day. And, um, but <laughs> yeah, I, time went real quick. <laughs> it did. It did. Went, it went really fast. And, um, I, I just enjoyed talking to, you know, role-playing games so much. Um, uh, but I will respect your time and our listeners time as well. <laughs> um, so thank you, uh, just so much for coming on the show today. Yeah, no problem. All right, there you have it, guys. I really hope you enjoyed my conversation with Richard today. As I mentioned in the episode, you can check out some of his adventures and other RPG products by visiting the show notes at dicegeeks.com. I have provided links there so you can easily check out some of Richard's awesome gaming material. Okay. If you want some free stuff, head over to dicegeeks.com slash free. You get 10 free dungeon maps. You'll never miss an episode of this show. And each and every Friday, you'll get an email update from me letting you know what is going on in the world of Dice Geeks. All right, guys. You know, I thank you so much for listening. It is my pleasure to come to you each and every Wednesday with an awesome new interview. I thank you so much for listening. And until next Wednesday, keep gaming.